Allison, and focusing on consciousness, one of the fundamental building blocks is my innate ability to know that you're thinking like I'm thinking, which it seems very natural, but it's what we call theory of mind. How innate is that? When does that develop? Uh, how can we understand the, um, uh, the, the, the history of how we have this sense that other people think like I do? Well, it's interesting because the, the idea of the other minds problem is a really deep philosophical problem. But the very idea of thinking about it as a psychological problem really emerged in the 80s in developmental psychology. Mm. So the first people to really talk about theory of mind were people who were concerned about children and how children could understand this, including me back in the 80s. Um, and what we've discovered is that while some elements seem to be in place literally innately, um, other elements of our understanding of the mind seem to only develop much later. So from the time that babies are born, for example, they can imitate your facial expressions. And that means that they make some linkages between the behavior they see on the part of another and what it feels like to be you mm -hmm. inside. Mm -hmm. and by the time they're seven or eight months old, maybe even earlier, they start understanding people as goal-directed agents, as people who can go out and make things happen in the world. And they start understanding the relationships between what you're trying to do and what you accomplish. And throughout infancy, they're getting more and more sophisticated kinds of understandings of how goals work and how human action works. By the time they're 18 months old, they can start understanding things like that I might want one thing and you could want another thing. Something that you might think was very sophisticated. So our, traditionally, we've said that children were bad at perspective taking until they were you know, well into the school age years. We did an experiment where we wanted to test that. So what we did was we took a bowl of raw broccoli and a bowl of goldfish crackers, and the experimenter would act as if she liked one and didn't like the other, and then put out her hand and ask the child to give you some. And 18 month olds would give her the broccoli if she liked the broccoli, and the crackers if she liked the crackers. So they already seem to understand something as strange as that <laughs> someone might actually like to eat raw broccoli. Um, uh, very early on, children seem to be understanding things about vision too. So they start to understand that you can't see something if it's behind an occluder, or that when someone moves their head like this, that they're looking at something that's over there that you can see as well. Well, By the classic is when children want to hide from you, they put their hands over their face yeah. because if they can't see you, they think you can't see them. Well, they're, during this period of infancy, they seem to be gradually developing this understanding of all the complicated ways that visual perception, visual perception actually works. Mm -hmm. But it's not until children are about three or four that they really seem to understand something about the way that our beliefs about the world work. And in particular, that they start to understand that the world could be a particular way, but I could represent or think about it in a way that's different from the way that it actually is. And this is the famous false belief test. What's an example? Where, for example, we did a version of this where we showed children um, uh, candy box. Um, and then when they opened it up, it turned out to be full of pencils. Mm -hmm. And we asked them these simple questions like, what did you think was inside this box when it was all closed up like this? What do you think is inside the box now? And what we and others discovered is that Four-year-old said, I always thought that there were pencils in the box. Mm. And, uh, sorry, three-year-old said, I always thought that there are were pencils in the box. But four-year-old said, oh, I used to think that there were candies in the box, mm. but I opened it, and now I know there are pencils. So think about it for a minute. These three-year-olds see the box, they say, candy! Mm. Um, and a second later, they're telling you that they always thought that there <laughs> were pencils in the box. So... The way that we explain this is that the children seem to think that the way that the world actually is, is the way that you're going to think about the world. They don't seem to understand the idea of a mismatch between your representation mm -hmm. of the world and mm -hmm. the way the world actually is. They don't seem to understand things about where beliefs come from, what, the fact that beliefs have particular sources. And then still later, children start to understand things like the fact that people have traits. So we've been doing some work about this recently. When do we start out thinking that people do things because of their deep internal individual traits? Some people are brave and some people are cowardly. Some people are smart and some people are stupid. It's not really until about seven that children seem to start understanding people in terms of the idea that they have these long lasting traits that lead to the way that they behave. What's so, an example of uh, an experiment that would show that? So what we did was, for instance, we showed um, we showed children two little dolls, uh, Mary and Sally, and uh, Mary goes on the diving board three out of four times, and then she also goes into the uh, she also goes on a bicycle three out of four times. 
But Sally only goes on the diving board one out of four times, only goes on the uh, bicycle one out of four times. And then we just ask children to explain that pattern of behavior. And what we find is that four-year-olds will say things like, well, maybe she's the older one, or she's the younger one, or she knows how to ride a bike. And six-year-olds will say, well, she's brave and she isn't brave. So the six-year-olds, and interestingly, if we give them the opposite pattern, so now we give them a pattern where both of the dolls play on the, uh, in the diving board, but not on the bicycle, let's say. So there it doesn't actually indicate traits. Six-year-olds will continue to say that the reason why mm -hmm. the uh, doll went on the diving board was because they were brave or because they were cowardly. So even when the evidence doesn't really support it, the six-year-olds, like adults, as it turns out, will explain things in terms of these underlying traits, whereas the four-year-olds are much more sensitive to what the evidence is actually telling you and much more likely to explain things in terms of desires or beliefs or the situations you find yourself in rather than in terms of these long-lasting individual traits. So seeing development of theory of mind, is, is that concept a legitimate one, or is it just a, a term that's being used for the, the, uh, um, the, 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 the way to deal with all these specific elements? Is it one concept or different ways, or is it a, an artificial word that we put on something right. that's a lot of specific things. Yeah, it's a little strange because it's come to be identified with this one thing, which is f passing the false belief task, understanding uh, the understanding of belief, which seems to at least have some important changes between four and six. But even at the beginning, from the 80s, when we were first, first starting to use the term, the idea was supposed to be that this is a theory. And one of the things about theories is they change. So what what I've argued is that just as you were thinking about a theory of mind in psychology, what you'd say is, well, there isn't just kind of one theory of mind. We've had lots of different theories of minds. And as we do more psychology, we change our ideas about what the mind is like. That's what science is like. And I think the same thing is happening with the children. So the children start out, they don't start out with a blank slate. They start out with a theory that's about emotions and about uh, uh, actions. And then they discover, well, wait a minute, to actually make sense out of what people do, I have to add in some more theoretical um, postulates, like that they have goals as well, or later that they have preferences, or later that they have perceptions, or even later that they have beliefs, even later that they have traits. So if you think about it like a scientist going out in the world, trying to make sense of the world, and then making theories up about explaining what they see, you could think about the child as going from one theory of, a mind, of the mind to another, and there's many, many different ones as, as, our evident, as we collect evidence. And, and I don't think that's a process that ever stops, even as adults, hopefully. We're getting more evidence, changing our views about how people work and how people's minds work. So rather than thinking of it as this, this thing about do we have a mind, theory of mind or not, or do other animals have a theory of mind or not, the way of thinking about it is that from as early as we can tell, children are never behaviorists. That's one thing we can say about them. They never think that actions are just not mm -hmm. caused by any underlying mental states. But their ideas about what those mental states are like and how they make sense and how they can be used to explain action, those are changing. And as they change, that has really deep consequences for the way that children interact socially, the way they understand things like deception or morality, the way that they understand themselves, the concept they have of themselves, even the way that they remember their own actions.